navigate our lives, right? We know this as uh, spiritual practitioners in unity, and I felt like we've been dealing with this coronavirus for so long. Let's look at that. Let's look at what our thoughts and beliefs are around that, shall we? All right, so let's start with where do we get our beliefs from? You know the ones? The ones that say, what's right? What's wrong? Who belongs? Who doesn't belong? Yeah, those type of beliefs. So that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I'm going to have some questions for you during the day, during this talk. And I'm just trying to pull up my PowerPoints so that you'll be with me. So just bear with me for a moment. All right. You know, when I was preparing this talk, the quote that came to mind was the Socratic quote. And it says that the unexamined life is not worth living. Right? The unexamined life is not worth living. And I think that that quote really holds us today as well. It holds us in what is ours to do. So it's a powerful statement on the journey of self-awareness, spiritual awakening, and freedom. There's no truer statement as important as it is today. We all know we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? We've been dealing with this for months. And a pandemic simply means a disease that impacts an entire country or world. And we call that disease the coronavirus, or some say COVID-19, right? So my first question to you is then, what is your belief? What is your belief about the disease? And I'm pulling it up on PowerPoint because sometimes, you know, when we talk, I, I'm from the East Coast, we naturally talk fast. And so I'm aware of that. So I wanted just to have a, a reference here for you to look at. What do you believe about this disease? I don't want you to overanalyze it. I don't want you to spiritualize your responses. Yeah. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks or says or believes about the disease. I want you to free associate. Meaning, let out the thoughts and feelings that are there. Whether you acknowledge them or not in your awareness, guess what? They're there. And what I find often in spiritual communities, we've become conditioned to only say positive things. And that's important, it's wonderful, and it's necessary for co-creation. And here's the thing. We are both human and spiritual. And this pandemic has really been calling us to shift because it requires us to make peace with both the human and the divine aspects and integrate them for wholeness. So if you're willing, I want you to take a nice deep breath in and exhale. And as you exhale, I want you to witness what your thoughts are around the disease. And I want you to do it without judgment, without judgment. You know, on my own spiritual journey, I've come to recognize that as a divine human being, guess what? I'm here on this planet to have all of the human experiences. Yes, the ones we really want, like the experiences of joy and happiness, but also those experiences that we may perceive as not of God, not of God. And on the surface, it's difficult to find anything good about COVID-19. You know, intellectually, we know that these bodies that we're in, they're not immortal, right? We're all mortal. It's going to pass and fade. And we know that our souls are eternal. And yet even knowing this truth, we feel anxiety and fear at this possible threat to our physical well-being or the physical well-being of those that we love. And I'm here to remind you, it is normal to feel these things. It's part of being human. What makes us think? 
that we should be any different than our wayshower. Do you remember Jesus when in his last days? He was in the garden, right, with his apostles. What did he say? Can this cup be passed? So even Jesus experienced feelings of fear and anxiety when he hoped to forego enduring the betrayal of his deepest friends and his ultimate crucifixion. Now, as a spiritual person, it's often difficult to allow ourselves to feel anxious. You know, we may have a belief that well, we shouldn't feel this way. You know, maybe it reflects poorly on us as spiritual practitioners. And maybe we question our faith and our centeredness. Well, I'm here to tell you, my friends, it's a myth. The dictionary has two definitions for the word anxious. The first one many of us know. Experiencing worry, unease, or nervousness, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. The second one's really interesting. Wanting something very much, typically with a feeling of unease. You see, anxiousness is felt whether we are worried or unsure, or even filled with desire, excitement, and happiness. Anxiety becomes a problem when we create a false belief that feeling anxiety is bad or wrong. Anxiety is simply part of the human condition. It's normal, my friends. Now, you may think, well, isn't she a minister? Isn't she like a unity minister? Doesn't she believe in all of this stuff? So you may think it's weird that I'm inviting you to acknowledge what your beliefs are, even if they seem to be negative. But hear this. We cannot shift what we do not acknowledge. Did you hear me? We cannot shift what we do not acknowledge. Yes, being positive is essential to co-creating an abundant life. But if our underlying fears are still driving us, then we're simply putting on band-aids on a wound when surgery is really needed. So how does that translate? It means we can have moments of joy, but if our foundation is fragile and easily broken apart by stimuli, joy will be fleeting, not sustainable. So that's why I'm really passionate about my work, which is about giving you permission to feel all your feelings, making peace with the entire spectrum and then integrating them into wholeness. We all know this. It's in our resistance, right? What we resist persists, right? We know that, we've been saying it. It's in our resistance to what is that we create angst and suffering. So where do our beliefs come from? Where would we get the belief that feeling anxiety, fear is bad and to be avoided at all costs? Well, I can share my journey. I learned that feeling anxiety or fear was wrong. I can remember being taught by my parents that being afraid or anxious wasn't acceptable. And this belief came partly from their inability to cope and nurture kids. They had us when they were young. And partly from wanting us to be perceived by others as strong, which they felt would keep us safe. That, my friend, is a myth. Can you remember when you first came onto this planet as a child? You know, as children, we are unconditional love and light. And as we get older, we are told the rules. First, it's the rules of our family system. Then it's the rules of how to behave in school and how to behave in church. And then it's how to fit in and behave appropriately within our culture, within our society. You see, this conditioning eventually becomes our view of the world. It becomes our belief system. All of the systems that are here on the planet right now, humanity, humans, has, they've created this over time, and it becomes ingrained into our own belief system. Depending on how our earliest cultural indoctrination occurred is how intrinsic those beliefs have become how we are taught, 
raised and developed becomes internalized in our psyche so much that we come to believe our understanding and perceptions are the right ones. And most importantly, the only one that matters. It's in our ability to understand that our beliefs are simply manufactured people, manufactured by other humans whom we've gone into agreement with. That is one of the most powerful concepts in our ability to change our thoughts and perceptions. Understanding that many of our embedded beliefs are fabrications, are constructs, that allows us to analyze, release, and then embrace new beliefs, which shifts our consciousness and enables us to co-create the world we choose to inhabit. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, that girl's gone crazy. What's up with that, Reverend? Don't we need rules? We need rules for our society. If we don't have them, there'll be chaos. And you know, on some level, I do agree. It's important to know how to navigate society and how to positively contribute, right? It's a good thing for the individual and for the group collective. It helps us all to get along together, right? Think of it like the rules of the road, right? When we're driving down the road to our destination, it's vital to our survival and safety to know that most, most people on the road understand when to stop, yield to another vehicle, which side of the road to drive on, how fast to go, how to change lanes, right? All of that. The rules of the road provide a way for all of us to shop, visit friends and family, travel, and much more with a relative certainty of doing this without killing ourselves or others. The problem occurs when the rules of the road become a hindrance, outdated, no longer viable or no longer useful to us. So I'll give you an example. As cars were coming into the mainstream in the early 1900s, there were quite weird rules of them Virginia. That's what it said. Women are prohibited from driving a car on Main Street unless her husband is walking in front of the car waving a red flag. Wow. That seems really strange. This rule was implemented, this rule was implemented as a means to slow down women drivers from spooking horses and killing pedestrians. Can you imagine if this rule was still in force today? We would call it insanity, among some other things. This rule would harm lots of people today if it was still an accepted rule of the road. The rule had to be analyzed. Does it work? Is it a hindrance? If it is, release, and then new rules are added. And I gotta tell you, our personal beliefs work the same way. A belief system that made sense to our parents or grandparents may no longer be applicable for us today. But often we think that their beliefs are our beliefs because we simply choose not to examine them to determine if they make sense for us today. And sure, we may be willing to change how we integrate like technology and scientific improvements, but often when it comes to intangible concepts such as emotions and faith, sexuality and gender, we're less willing to examine whether our understanding and beliefs make sense, are still valid, and are even ours or just what we've been conditioned to believe. So my next question to you is about a new rule that's come up. Today we're told about wearing a mask and that social distancing is what's needed to stem the spread of the coronavirus. And so what meaning are you making about this rule? What's your belief around it? You know, maybe you think it's unnecessary Maybe you think it's good for everyone. Maybe you see it as the collapse of the economy or it's just inconvenient or fear mongering or really not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. 
or maybe you simply see yourself as a metaphysician and therefore I'm immune. I won't get COVID. You see, we are meaning making machines. And so I'm inviting you to really look at what beliefs do you hold of this new rule? And the reason that I ask you to look at your thoughts is what meaning we make, what belief we hold is what will make this time constrictive or expansive. Do you hear me, right? Now, my friends, we are on the precipice of great change. We are being asked to challenge our beliefs. We are asked to be challenging our beliefs. Do we continue to accept the existing systems that are in place right now? Or do we co-create new systems in which everyone thrives? Well, everyone thrives. Social distancing is a new system put in place, right? And supposedly from the doctors and the medical field, it's, it's to stem the exponential spread of the coronavirus. But if we hold on to the old way of hugging and breathing on each other, you know what? Many more people are going to get ill and possibly die. The old systems that have been in existence, they've been agreed upon by many generations. And we may say, well, I didn't create the system. But we have also gone into acceptance and agreement with these existing systems. And once we learn how to navigate them successfully, it's really difficult to give up. If the old system, we find worth and praise and abundance, to ask us to give up a system we are really successfully operating within can seem as if it's a threat to our very survival. You see, it's human nature to want to be seen as successful. And we will do everything we can to uphold the status quo, even if it means others don't thrive. And I think this may shed light on what's really going on in our country right now. Well, let's look at our belief system in another way. And I'll use the analogy of how our computers operate. Most of us have come to realize that in order to function in our society, we must be able to operate computers quickly and effectively. When our computers slow down or don't have enough memory or storage necessary to keep pace with the technological advancements, what do we do? We know we must upgrade. Now this upgrade sometimes is as simple as downloading a piece of software that can correct the errors we're experiencing. However, there are times when we must get a whole new computer system because the old one just won't work for us. And our belief systems, you know, work the same way. We also have to do this assessment to determine what's working, what's outdated, what needs upgrading or maybe just replacing altogether. This analytical introspection happens by reviewing our belief systems. Now I know many of you are probably feeling like you're in limbo and uncertainty as all of this is going around us. It's happening to all of us, even for me. You know, I think my spiritual beliefs and, and practices are pretty solid. I mean, I celebrate being home with my hubby and the dogs, while at the same time I'm wondering what type of world are we awakening to? But through this uncertainty and uncomfortability, I'm committed to continue to examine my beliefs. Why do I do this? Because let's face it, it takes some work. I do it because I want to be part of the evolution of consciousness that is occurring across the globe. Today I accept and I love all of my feelings across the infinite spectrum of my humanity because that's part of the human experience. 
and, and I also access my divine nature, allowing the frequency of love and light to vibrate through my consciousness to find new ways of embracing this new normal. So here's my final question. I'm going to share that with you. What new belief can you create to thrive during this time? What new beliefs can you create to thrive during this time? As I've spoken to other people across the country, you know, it's what comes up as an answer an awful lot is I've prioritized what really matters to me. I've discerned that being with my family, spending more time with them is what really matters. I've realize that being in comfy clothes and working from home, I'm even more effective. Maybe for you it's allowing for a recalibration of what is yours to do, to get clear, to discern that change is here. You could fight it and be miserable or start to figure out how you can add to it. So I started off with the Socratic quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. It's a call for us to shift from being a simple cog in the wheel to creating new ways for everyone to thrive. It asks us to question the status quo of our lives. It requires that we ask ourselves, how can we grow? How can we create? How can we manifest even when COVID-19 is occurring? It suggests that even in social distancing, we can choose to create anew and take stock of what truly matters in our lives. Purpose-filled lives require us to occupy a consciousness of questioning, questioning our culture, questioning society, questioning our beliefs and the established systems that we operate within today. Self-actualization demands that we discern if the beliefs we hold are our truths or the truths of our parents or society. So today I'm just really happy to be here to celebrate each of you on this journey of awakening consciousness. You said yes to being here at this time, at this juncture. So that means that you are ready to co-create a world that works for all. And I celebrate you in that. Thank you.